Welcome back again, everyone. Today is November 8th. It's been just about a month since I started these regular updates, and today we're going to continue that with a overview of the recent news events that have been going on, uh, followed by a final portfolio update. The focus of today is going to be looking at companies that have experienced either failures or significant adversity, looking at the fundamentals of these businesses and seeing whether these businesses are something that I think that I might have been invested in and kind of using that to recage and see, okay, is the method that I'm using to evaluate businesses something that's accurate and something that will protect me from these potential significant downsides. We're going to start off looking at the WeWork bankruptcy, and this will be interesting more so because the company's had a history of being a publicly traded company. There's a little bit of a background to this company that we can go through and do a little bit of analysis on. Uh, secondly, we'll look at how Sam Bankman fried is facing a lot of time in jail potentially, um, and also the potential for FTX to come back in a new and revived form with a different funding and, of course, different management. Next, we'll look at the resolution of the fourth strike and what type of impacts it seems like it's going to have on the company as a whole. And then finally, we'll do a real quick overview of the portfolio and see where we currently stand this week. Here we are looking at WeWork, and WeWork as a company has had a historic um, losses, right? Because just the stage of the, the business cycle that they're in, they're in the, the startup to early growth stage, coming around the same time, a little bit later, after the Uber and the Airbnb blitz scaling that they're trying to enact where Airbnb is profitable and Uber is nearing, or by some metrics, at profitability. WeWork uh, was apparently never able to get there. Now, talking a little bit more about the business cycle and the different stages of the business, of course, we have like the intro, the startup stage, the growth or hyperscaling stage, the mature stage, and then the decline stage. So in terms of what metrics are best to use to try and get evaluation for a business for each specific stage, uh, I am... Uh, I will openly admit I am not good at valuing uh, the the startup and the hyper growth stage of businesses. I, I just don't. It's not what I've. It's not what I've done. It's not what I've had any, any success in, and I don't have any experience in it. Um, sure, in the future I might have more experience in it, but as of right now, I've, I'm really. It's out of my depth. However, for someone potentially trying to uh, value these two different stages of businesses, you might look at total addressable market, uh, maybe in the later stages of the growth stage, earnings per share growth, and, uh, and I'm sure that there's other metrics that people that value these businesses frequently use, and I'm sure people can be successful with it. I am just not one of those people. However, when it comes to my focus, I definitely focus on the mature to even somewhat starting decline, uh, depending on the cases, the best, worst base case for the business. Uh, so you see with Meta, it was a mature stage that that first drop off in users. And so people thought that it was entering the decline stage, which turned out fortunately not to be true. That was the biggest return I've had, um, consisted of the majority of the returns in my prof uh, portfolio. Then we get to the decline stage. Maybe people say PayPal is currently in a decline stage. It could be true. You know, they, they might never grow revenue again. But even if they don't, right, based off our valuations, it's relatively fairly valued, maybe even a little bit undervalued uh, if they just grow that free cash flow at the 5% discount rate. So these are the two predictable businesses that, that I can kind of look at and see, okay, in these two stages, they have a established history of free cash flow. I understand what they're doing with stock-based comp, even if I might, dis, uh, might disagree with it in the case of PayPal. But uh, the real thing is the consistency, which makes it easy for me to, as a relatively novice investor, look forward and see what do I think will be the case in 10 years and uh, what do I think the value based off of that is. Now, of course, the downside of this focus on the mature and declining stage businesses is that I could potentially miss a thousand hundred extra returns from tiny microcap stocks that just IPO and then grow over the course of 10 years, right? Just because I, I don't have the foresight to see what they're valued at. However, the good part about that is that uh, the companies, a lot of the ones like WeWork that was, uh, it was sent out via a special purpose acquisition company, right? A SPAC, uh, it, it really isn't worth investing in and now it's bankrupt. So it, it wasn't worth investing at the start, uh, at least in my opinion, right? Naturally, someone could disagree with that, but the focus of my portfolio is to take very concentrated 50% plus of my portfolio in one stock, right? Individual stocks being a large amount of my, my portfolio, and I just don't think that that strategy of investing works with companies that are, they're, they're sort of like binary options, right? Either we work goes bankrupt or it has massive su success is what's priced in to that, that initial IPO with that SPAC. One last thing before we move on from our discussion about WeWork, it's important to understand that it wasn't just like overnight, it realized the company was insolvent and then they, they had to cease operations. It was a continual process, starting off with, with Newman, of course, who started the company and had a hefty billion dollar exit, exit right? 
Um, so we, we see here, first they filed for IPO, but short, showed lo large losses, 1.9 billion and 1.8 billion in 2018. And then he stepped down after uh, allegations of self-dealing. There are a few cases where he actually like had properties that he then rented to WeWork. So he was on both sides of the deal. And then like, I, I think even here, uh, it doesn't mention it here, but he sold the, or, like, he sold the trademark we to we work for six million dollars which then was later reversed so like th this guy is just a corporate raider of his own company it seems and this is all known in, in 2019 right uh withdrew its ipo then and then they had some replacements of the company focus on a core business fundamentals of which remain strong that's not true the fundamentals were not strong they did they never generated free cash flow in any quarter that they've ever existed uh, SoftBank CEO, um, really unfortunate that they decided to invest in WeWork. I guess they're trying to catch the next Uber, which, you know, that's what they do, venture capital fund. They lost more billions of dollars every quarter, continuing on. They have a $9 billion valuation now. They go public through a, a special purpose acquisition company. The shares rise 13%, um, even though it's still losing to billions of dollars. And then uh, pre-pandemic occupancy levels and 72%. So all, all this is, is fine from here on out, but there's plenty of there's plenty of knowledge prior to see that this was a company that loses money. It was a company that had a corporate raider as a CEO that started the company, that did more advertising into like crazy office parties than actually producing something that builds cash and generates a profit every month, right? So the, there's just a lot of red flags that went into the business before even seeing that like, okay, their cash pile is depleting, they're running out of resources. This is probably not something that we should be fully invested in. Now, moving on from one bankrupt company, we come to another uh, collapsed company. It's focusing first off on Sam Bankman Freed. Now, I'm not interested in talking too much about what SPF has done. Uh, I, it's not legal, it's my, my strong suit, obviously. He abused and lost billions in customer funds and now faces 110 years max sentence with these experts saying that they'd be surprised if he received less than two and a half decades. What I am interested in talking about, however, is how there's nothing really that FTX customers or people that stored crypto in FTX could have foreseeably done or known to avoid that. It was just another crypto exchange that exists. And people always kind of knew like that there's no SBIC uh, or FDIC insurance, obviously, on all the, the supposed funds that were invested in this exchange. And if the exchange went up in smoke, it wasn't clear what, if anything, could be done to retrieve those lost funds. Now, unlike the losses in WeWork, this is something that I could reasonably have foreseen myself experiencing a capital loss in, because although I feel confident that there's really not a universe in which I would have invested in WeWork, if there is a universe in which I would have had funds or crypto stored at FTX. And although I don't currently own crypto, everyone's heard the phrase, not your keys, not your crypto. So maybe the best way is an actual like offline cold storage, or at least something where you possess the keys to, to your crypto. Or alternatively, we just wait until there's like a, a spot Bitcoin ETF and then presumably, I'm not exactly up, up to date with what would be implied with that, but it seems like that would fall under the SIPC insurance uh, for stocks and stocks and bonds. So lesson for me going forward is to make sure that I do not own crypto in an exchange unless there's some insurance agency or insurance method or I possess my own keys to the crypto. Now, looking at the next company, Ford Motors will be a little more interesting than uh, even the previous two because Ford Motors is certainly something that I could have seen myself being invested in either in the past or potentially even in the future. Uh, so there are a few key points that we need to look at to see what the what does this company look like in 20 years, right? So recently the, the strike was broken and the union seems to be very happy with what they got. Ford Motors hasn't really commented much on it, but it does raise the question of what does this new company look like in the future given this union. And the biggest thing is the most recent earnings call. They state, stated that the new contract would add around 900 to to $1,000 in cost to each car the company builds. And uh, based off of this, I just have one simple question. Tesla does not have a union that they're negotiating against. Tesla can open plants, close plants, fire employees, hire new employees, pay them whatever the predominant market rate is at that time. And this diversity of options that Tesla has in terms of production allows them a lot more flexibility to deal with supply chain shocks that may be coming in the future, especially with the China-Taiwan crisis, or even more probably just move into more competitive and more cost advantageous areas of the market, focus on making more Model 3s instead of Model Ys, moving people from car manufacturing plants to battery plants, Tesla can do it all. This new contract, the new deal with the union that Ford Motors just made, made it so that the union can strike if Ford tries to close a plant. So if Ford has a plant that is operating and losing them money year over year, a significant amount of money, the UAW could start a strike around any number of plants, whatever they deem fit, 
to protest them closing that plant. The costs that this new contract will bear to Ford is significantly impacting their ability to roll out new electric vehicles. Employees don't want to be displaced by new employees that are focused in different sectors coming in and working on the EV cars. And even if all of those strategic and structural methods that are impacting Ford's ability to produce revenue for shareholders, stakeholders, were removed or discounted for, we still have the problem of it being about a $1,000 increase in cost per car that Ford produces. How could Ford ever dream of competing economically with Tesla when Ford's cars have a $1,000 increase in price across the board for them to produce? It just isn't possible. Before we talk a little bit more about Tesla and the comparison between Tesla and Ford, let's look at uh, a simple DCF on Ford. So here I have a 4% growth rate for the growth and the terminal stage, which is a little bit lower than the discount rate. I don't think there's going to be a significant free cash flow growth per share for, per, uh, for Ford going forward. We try to get a number for our free cash flow uh, per share, and we come out looking at the past five years, 252, 466, 240, 0, 132 being a little bit conservative, kind of averaging those out, it probably comes out to two. I cut that in half because who knows what they're, we've, we've not seen a quarter yet post the UAW strike. So I don't know what the free cash flow is going to look like with those increased costs per car. However, with all that, with a 4% growth in the growth and terminal stage of a $1 free cash flow gets us to a uh, sort of the reverse DCF of implying an 11% return. So if they're able to maintain that $1, grow it below inflation, right below the federal funds rate for the next 10 years, that's a reasonable valuation for Ford. So that's that's not too bad in terms of you know what's implied in the stock price now. And I think that that's probably something they can maintain. However, this is definitely like a, a sort of rosy base case, in my opinion. It'd be very easy to see this free cash flow per share not only not grow, but continue declining uh, in the future years, in my opinion, especially with those in increased costs that we've been talking about. Here we have a graph uh, doing an analysis on Tesla from The Motley Fool recently, and this has charted the gross net, uh, I'm sorry, the total net profit per delivered vehicle for Tesla. If you look at the dashed blue line, it's somewhere in like this five, $6,000 range per, net, per vehicle they produce, even giving the benefit of the doubt to Ford to assume that they were somewhere in that range. Now, I haven't been able to find out on Ford and I'm not super interested, super invested in calculating myself, but we'll, let's just give Ford the benefit of the doubt and assume that they're similar, even though they're probably significantly reduced, would be my bet. However, all right, let's say that they were able to do five to $6,000 net profit for, per car. Now, post the UAW strike, now that five to six thousand is four to five thousand, best case, right? So they're making one thousand dollars less per car that they sell than than Tesla is. It, it just isn't cost competitive because each car, each, each additional car that Tesla sells is just an, an additional thousand dollars that they can return to shareholders. They can invest in infrastructure. They can re invest in R and D to produce new and better vehicles to further outcompete Ford. It just isn't something that's sustainable in the long run. Come 10, 15 years. Now we're going to finish off today with a really quick portfolio update. Uh, not much has changed in the past past week or so. The only change has been in the Robinhood account where I was finally able, past that uh, one year mark, able to exit the meta position that had both the synthetic short and the underlying 100 shares. So fortunately I was able to pull that out of the portfolio and put that right back into PayPal. So now my Robinhood account is basically entirely PayPal with a few thousand dollars uh, spread around like Dick supporting good calls. Alibaba calls, and then the NVIDIA put, uh, the bear put spread. As you can see, total value of the account has come up to about 71600 so a nice recovery in the past week. I think that's like $3,500 up in the past week. Again, really, I wasn't worried too much about that dip back then. I'm not too excited about the recovery now, although it's better than a, better than dip, of course. Uh, we'll really just see where these PayPal positions go in the, uh, the coming few years, really. Overall, I hope this was at least somewhat useful, somewhat, uh, somewhat a little bit of insight into my analysis and what goes into my mind when I'm looking at different companies and why I may or may not want to invest in Ford. You know, probably not unless it takes a, a further decline. And then why hopefully companies like WeWork stay out of my investment portfolio uh, in the future. And then uh, as well, most importantly, that I, I stay out of places where my, my money's uninsured or I have no recourse, no real options to go forward and try to try to claw back that money after it's gone, right? And that's the whole point of buying companies that are a steep discount to their, their margin of safety, right? Take that 30, 40% margin of safety discount, make sure that we're buying companies that produce loads of cash flow over time and that cash, they can do whatever. They can buy back shares if the company's too cheap. They can distribute it in dividends if the company's more expensive and they don't have any other reinvestment opportunities, right? So that's kind of my, my trifecta. Uh, free cash flow per share, loads of it, relatively safe valuation, or at least there's nothing too crazy the company needs to do to justify the current valuation. 
That's why I'm happy with my current holdings in PayPal because their valuation implies that they could do a free cash flow growth of 5%, which is the discount rate, and that would be a fair value for the company for the next 10 years, right? That is a very conservative valuation in my opinion, which is why I'm comfortable holding the stock. As well as they have free cash flow, which gives them the options to do whatever the most prudent option is. And that free cash flow gives me the resiliency of knowing that the shares of PayPal that I own are a part ownership in, in the business that produces this amount of cash every quarter. As well as, of course, all my accounts are well under the $250,000 limit for SIPC insurance. So just a little cherry on top there. And all of that is why I feel comfortable knowing I could go to sleep tomorrow, not check any of these investments, aside from the options, which is a little different story that we'll talk about in a future date. But all the underlying shares that I own in PayPal and Dix, I could not check those for another year and I'd be totally fine. I would not need to get a continual price quote from the market on the equity ownership of the business that I have uh, for the next year, and I'd be totally fine holding those and just reading the, the 10 Qs coming out.